Good afternoon. Today is February 12th, 2008. We are in Natick, Massachusetts, and this audio tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Joan Craig. Our audio recorder is Carol Bartlett. We are privileged to have with us today Richard C. Johnstone. Welcome, Dick. How are you? I'm fine, thank you, Dick. Thank you for coming today. Could I ver ask you where you were born and when? Yes, I was born in Waltham, Massachusetts uh, on August 13th, 1922. And you currently live in where? I live in uh, Nashua, New Hampshire. And your marital status? I am married for some 64 years. That's wonderful. <laughs> That's remarkable. And your wife's name? Uh, wife's name is Marion. And do you have children? Yes, we have three children, uh, two sons and a daughter. And, and I might add, if I, I'd like to add that we've got uh, three grandchildren and two great-grandchildren and one great-grandchild uh, on the way. So we, we've been uh, blessed with a wonderful family. That's great. Where and when did you enter the military? I entered in Augusta, Maine. Uh, uh, when I was a sophomore at Bowdoin College on August the 15th, 1942, and that was two days after my 20th birthday. And why did you decide to join at that time? Well, uh, it, it was the thing to do. Uh, most of us young guys were upset and angered, I think, a little bit at the Hitler and Japanese aggressors, and I think we just wanted to be a part of putting an end to what we think was, was an unjust war. And what branch of the service did you join? I joined the United States Marine Corps. Why? Why did you decide to join that? I think all of us young guys uh, thought that the Marine Corps was, was the best and the most exciting branch, and it had such a great history and such a great reputation, and we wanted to be a part of that history, I think. You were a sophomore at Bowdoin, did family or friends or other classmates from Bowdoin join with you? Many of our uh, classmates, uh, Bowdoin classmates, uh, uh, joined when I did, and a lot of my uh, hometown friends, longtime friends, uh, also joined the different branches of the service. It was the thing to do at that time. And where were you sent for your basic training? I was sent to uh, uh, boot camp at Paris Island, South Carolina. Tell us what it was like. Well, it was completely different from anything I'd ever seen before. Uh, our sergeants uh, embarrassed us, they humiliated and belittled us, uh, both physically and, <laughs> and mentally. Uh, we endured a lot of rough, rough treatment, but gradually we understood why we were being treated as we were. We, uh, I guess we, we learned to take it and we became very proud that we could take it. What do you remember that you liked or disliked about boot camp? Well, uh, I think I liked the, the competition, I liked the camaraderie, and, and uh, I liked the challenge. And there was really nothing I, 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 I disliked. I knew why we received the rough treatment that we were getting. It was just part of the, the making of a Marine. Did you receive any advanced or specialized training beyond basic training? Oh yes, yeah. following Paris Island Boot Camp, we were sent to Quantico, Virginia for 10 weeks of OCS, uh, that was Officer Candidate School, and, and uh, those 10 weeks were followed by another 12 weeks called Reserve Officer Training, and that was also at Quantico. And how is it determined what kind of advanced training you'd receive? Well, we were really earmarked from the very beginning as college kids who, who might have officer potential. And when we arrived at Paris Island, we were assigned to an office candidate platoon. And if we survived boot camp, uh, we were expected to be sent to Quantico for officer training. And that was the plan, really, from the very beginning. 
And as a result, um, was that your specialty during the remainder of your military career? Well, as I say, we were trained from the very beginning to be Marine Corps uh, infantry officers, and we expected that, I guess, most of us would end up fighting the Japanese in the Pacific Theater. And where was your first duty station after um, schools that you attended? Well, after successfully graduating from uh, OCS in, in reserve officer schools, uh, I received orders to uh, report out to uh, Camp Pendleton in Oceanside, California to be assigned to a, a Marine Infantry uh, Combat Division. Were you sent there uh, individually, or were you part of a unit? I was sent there as an individual. What did you do when you were there? Well, I became a member of H Company, 3rd Battalion, 27th Regiment, in the 5th Marine Division, and I was a second lieutenant officer, and they put me in charge of the 60 millimeter mortar section in that company. And where did you go from there? Well, we were at Camp Pendleton for eight, about eight months, and then we shipped out to Hawaii, to Camp Tarawa, and that was in August of 1944. Were you in direct combat with the enemy? Mm, not at that time, no. We were, uh, it was just more training for Pacific Island combat somewhere. Um. You knew you were going to possibly have combat with the Japanese, I assume? Yes, we, we knew that for sure. And when and where, or going well, to Hawaii, did you know what your next step was? No, we, we didn't know at that point uh, where or when, but of course we knew it was going to be against the Japanese. And we left uh, Camp Taro in late 1945, January 1945, and we spent some a short time off Pearl Harbor, and then we left for Iwo Jima early in February 1945. And you were, again, with H Company, 3rd Battalion, you yep. mentioned earlier. Always with that unit, yep. And your rank, again, continued to be 2nd uh, Lieutenant? I was a 2nd Lieutenant, yes. Mm -hmm. Tell us about the air and naval support that you had. Well, Iwo Jima was built into a super fortress. And for many, many years, uh, underground tunnels and rooms and passageways were built deep under the hills, uh, several stories deep in, in some cases. And, uh, and these tunnels and rooms and passageways uh, ran underground the entire five-mile length of the island, uh, all the way from Mount Suribachi at the south end uh, Catano Point at the north end of the island, and the big Japanese guns uh, rolled on tracks in and out of these hills. And when our planes and ships began firing, the Japs just went underground to, to safety and took their big guns with them until our firing stopped. So early in the battle, our air and naval support was not as effective as we had hoped it might be. So eventually, did it get better? Yes, yeah, eventually. It, it took a while, but eventually it, was, uh, it proved to be effective. Being on this island, were your clothes and uh, gear adequate for the climate? And do you remember what the climate was like? Yeah, well, like the, uh, the, the climate was moderate. And uh, uh, I, we had Marine Corps dungarees and so forth. and, and uh, they were, they were fine. They were suitable for us. And what was the terrain like? Well, the beach where we landed was black and soft, uh, almost ash-like. It was volcanic ash. It was difficult to walk on and, and certainly very hard to crawl on. And the ground in places was uh, rough and rocky, and there were some high hills, and, and of course there was this very large Volcano, Mount Suribachi, uh, at one end, and of course that was where the famous flag raising took place. And that was, if I might ask, after you landed on Iwo Jima? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What 
what else? What else did Iwo Jima, Iwo Jima remind you of? You know, for, for the most part, it looked very barren. The, the, the trees and foliage had pretty much been cut down. It was a, a pretty desolate looking place uh, for the most part. It, it did have some, some hills throughout the island. And you were an officer. Do you feel you and other officers uh, were good leaders? I think so. I think we were trained well. Uh, and uh, uh, our men, I think we responded to our orders and what we were supposed to do. And, uh, and, uh, and I think uh, the men appreciated what we were doing for them. And were you ever wounded in combat? No, not actually wounded, but... However, on our second day on the island, as we were moving out in the attack under very, very heavy Japanese mortar fire, uh, I was hit on the left shin with a spent piece of shrapnel that uh, uh, <laughs> knocked me very quickly to the ground and it was not a serious injury as I had on a pair of knee-high paratrooper boots and I have no idea where I got them, but uh, had I been wearing regular marine issue boots, uh, I might have suffered a broken leg. And my assumption is you got medical attention for that. Would you evaluate the quality of the medical care you received? Uh, really, uh, doctors and medical corpsmen did an outstanding job uh, under pretty difficult conditions. and The corpsmen especially did, did a great job uh, treating the wounded uh, while under fire and uh, uh, really unbelievable. And one of our corpsmen, one of our H Company corpsmen, a fellow named Howland Willis, uh, received the Congressional Medal of Honor for, for uh, uh, outstanding bravery. Did you hear about the progress of the war in other areas? Uh, we received some reports, really not, not very much. How did you receive your news? Well, uh, word of mouth, when we were rehabbing in a, a rear area for a, a day or two. <laughs> and I might add that rear areas were not very rare. They might be 500 to 1,000 yards behind the front lines. So rehabbing meaning you were on the front line and then you would go back and someone else would go on the front line? Periodically mm -hmm. we, we would do that. We'd be on the front lines for uh, two or three days and then we would be relieved and go to a rear area, as I say, a few hundred yards behind the lines for rest and a little, little relaxation, and then we'd take our turn again up on the front lines, and it was, we, we did that all during the battle. And where did you go? How long were you in Iwo Jima? Uh, we were on Iwo Jima from uh, uh, just about 32 days, as I recall. And from there, did you go back to Hawaii? Yeah, we went back to Camp Terror again in Hawaii, and we were getting ready for the invasion of Japan. Were you given any kind of what we call now R&R, &R or rest and, what is that, rest and recovery or rest and relaxation? Yeah, rest and relaxation, they call it. And uh, Yeah, we had, we had liberty fairly often uh, 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 in a little town named Camuela. And that was seven or eight miles uh, uh, from, from Camp Tarawa. And also, I think we had one, one, uh, one nice liberty in the town of Hilo, Hawaii. And that was the largest city of, on the big island of Hawaii. And, and I think after Iwo, we visited Honolulu and Waikiki Beach one time. So those were, we did have some rest and relaxation from time to time. Before combat, how much did you know about the enemy that you faced? Well, of course, we know the Japanese uh, were a fanatical and a, and a very difficult enemy, and we knew they would commit Harry Carey before they would surrender, and uh, we knew they would be a, a tough and difficult enemy. And do you feel you were properly trained and equipped for the combat that you faced? Yeah, very definitely. In, in Paris Island, Quantico, Pendleton, Camp Tarawa. I think we had good training at all these locations. Uh, but, you know, because Iowa was so different from previous Pacific battles, we, we had to learn as, as, as the battle progressed. And 
and the enemy were hidden in underground tunnels and, and, and caves. They, we ever, hardly ever saw a live enemy. The Japs fought a, a harassing kind of warfare. They were popping in and out of hidden emplacements and infiltrating our lines of defense at night under the cover of darkness. And, and I might add that each night the Japs would try to sneak through our lines of defense. And my mortars and our Navy ships uh, would fire flares uh, over our front lines to keep it lighted up uh, to help our dug-in Marines uh, see the enemy as they tried to sneak through our lines. And do you feel your weapons were um, equal to, better, or in inferior to what you were facing? No, I feel that they were definitely better. Mm-hmm. And when and where were you discharged? Uh, I was discharged in in Boston, Boston, Massachusetts, uh, uh, in June of 1946. And what rank at that time? And with what decorations? I uh, uh, was a first lieutenant at that time, and I received the Bronze Star Medal. And might we explain the Bronze Star Medal for? Well, <laughs> it wasn't a Congressional Medal of Honor, but uh, the Bronze Star medal was given to me, and I'm very proud to have received it. Uh, I guess they cited a couple of examples. Uh, at one point in the battle, one of my best friends, who had been uh, commander of, of the second rifle platoon in that company, was killed. And I took over his, uh, his second platoon uh, for the rest of the, uh, almost to the end of the battle. and. Uh, and the battle was almost over. We thought we were going on board ship the next day, but things got bad at the very end, and they decided we had to regroup, and we had lost heavily of men. So they made one, uh, one platoon, one rifle platoon out of our whole H company, and I volunteered to lead that platoon in the whole to attack the last pocket of enemy resistance. And so we were up at Catano Point uh, from the very end of the battle, and uh, then we were finally relieved by some uh, army personnel, and we went back to where we had landed uh, on the island uh, 31 or 32 days before and went aboard ship and came back to Hawaii. But uh, I guess they thought I did a good job for uh, taking over two rifle platoons at a critical time, and they gave me the Bronze Star. I'm very proud of that. And you should be. Yeah. Thank you. What, do you feel, what were you feeling about coming home? It was a wonderful feeling, of course. I, I hadn't seen my wife, I hadn't seen my mother and dad, and other family members and friends for almost two years. And of course, it was a feeling of pride and thankfulness and an accomplishment, especially a feeling of thankfulness. When you came home, did you discuss, were you, were you married at the time? You mentioned your wife. Yes, so I, you were I, married. I, I was married at the time. Mm -hmm. So did you discuss with your wife or other family members or friends what you had seen or done while you were in the service? Uh, to some degree, yes, not overly so. I answered questions that were asked of me. A number of our interviewees, uh, Dick, have said they kind of moved on and went right back to their, what we might call, regular life. Do you feel that you wanted to just move on and get back to the way things were? I felt that way, and, uh, and, and, and I did. I, I, I believe I did move back uh, to, to regular life. It, it had been a good life for me. Uh, I've been a very lucky. I had been a very lucky, lucky guy, and, uh, and uh, uh, I, I returned to normal living. Did you join any unit of the military reserve? I remained in the Marine Corps Reserve for almost a year after coming home, and, and then I resigned my commission. And did you join any veterans organizations? 
such as the American Legion? Yes, I did. I, I joined the American Legion and I am, I'm still a member. Have you received any veterans benefits such as the GI Bill or hospitalization no, insurance? No, not, uh, not really. I, I had already graduated from college uh, so I didn't have an opportunity to take advantage of the GI Education Bill. Did you attend any reunions of your old outfit? Yes, I've attended uh, several 5th Division reunions over the years, and, and I always attend uh, the annual Marine Corps birthday luncheon in Boston each year. The Marine Corps birthday uh, is uh, November 10th, and I always attend that uh, anniversary luncheon. How important do you feel serving in the military was or is to you? As I look back, uh, I think it was very important. Uh, I think it taught us teamwork and loyalty to others. and uh, I think it taught us to live by the Marine Corps motto, Semper Fidelis, Simplify, always faithful. And it's a motto I try to live by. And, and I, I have to tell you that I, I saw many instances of young men being, certainly being faithful to their bodies risking their lives to, to, to help their buddies, uh, shouting warnings if they saw a Jap suddenly appear, or uh, if one of their buddies was in, suddenly in danger, or if a, if a buddy was wounded. And, and I have to say again that the faithfulness and the bravery of the corpsman uh, was, was almost unbelievable. Do you feel it has affected your life? Uh, no question, absolutely. Uh, I think it's affected my life for the better, and, and I'm thankful that I think it's helped me in dealing with people. I think it's helped me in making decisions. Uh, perhaps it helped me a lot in uh, managing my job when I was working for almost 40 years with a telephone company. And I really believe the military has made most veterans better people in many, many ways. Looking back on it all, was there a memorable experience in your military career? I had a number of memorable experiences, uh, but one of the most memorable happened on uh, D-Day plus four, the fourth day after the battle when our battalion uh, was moving north up the island and we were moving very, very slowly under heavy enemy artillery fire and at one point one of my men said to me, uh, Lieutenant, look behind you. And when I turned and looked, I could see the American flag flying from the top of Mount Suribachi. And I knew then that the 28th Regiment had taken that very critical Japanese stronghold. And I guess seeing that flag gave me a, a feeling of pride and, and confidence, a feeling that nothing was going to stop us from winning this battle and, and winning the war. It was a, a memorable and an emotional experience. How about a character, a memorable character? Yeah, we, we, we had a number of characters characters, I think, but, but there was one in particular, and he was a very special character uh, in our boot camp platoon at Paris Island. He was a big guy, uh, an outstanding college football player, uh, a happy-go-lucky guy, a guy who made us laugh when he imitated Winston Churchill with his V for victory sign uh, while puffing on a cigar. Uh, he was a good guy, a good Marine, and, uh, but he was a real character. Was there a humorous experience you'd like to share with us? Yeah, we had several, I'm sure, but, but the one I recall in, in, involved uh, the same character that I just mentioned. And I'll never forget one day, uh, it was near the end of our training at Paris Island Boot Camp. Our platoon sergeant was proudly showing us off uh, we had become very good marchers, and he was proud of us. And at one point, the sergeant barked out the command, by the right flank, 
Hutch! And the entire 40 man platoon turned to the right, except for my pal, who all by himself turned left. And the sergeant was furious, really, really teed off. And uh, especially to have this happen in front of some of his competing drill instructors. And he hollered our platoon and stood us at attention and then he walked over to my guilty friend who was standing off to the side all by himself. And the sergeant looked up at this very big former college football player and loudly asked, why when the command was to the right you turn left? And my friend realizing that he had to answer the question rather sheepishly replied, I was excited. <laughs> The sergeant then told my friend that he obviously didn't know his right from his left, and he said, I'm going to teach you. And he stomped rather heavily on, on one of my friend's feet, and he told him in a loud voice, you'll now know which is which. Your right one is your sore one. And uh, uh, I might add that the sergeant didn't stomp hard enough to cause injury, but he stomped hard enough that my friend, I'm sure, will always remember his right from his left. That's great. Above all, is there one thought or incident that you'd like to share with your family or others who will also see, listen to this tape? Yes. <clears throat> there is an incident that I, I would like to share. It's an incident that took place on the very first night we were on the island an incident that will live with me as, as long as I live. And after suffering extremely heavy casualties during the beach landing on D-Day, H Company slowly moved beyond the beach and uh, out from under the heaviest of Japanese fire. And a few hours passed because and dusk began to settle in and it came time for us to dig in and form a line of defense for the night. And I remember that my, my mortar section foxholes happened to be adjacent to the H Company command post where Commanding Officer Ralph Fall and Company Executive Officer Bob McCahill were dug in, uh, along with a couple of artillery observers and, and I think some other staff personnel, probably seven or eight Marines in this, this small crater. And as darkness set in, it, it became very damp and, and cold. I was in a foxhole with my platoon sergeant, Dave Moses, and uh, we were 15 or 20 yards from the edge of the command post. And as we H Company Marines were sitting quietly in our foxholes, two men to a hole, we were watching and waiting, and. There was an uncomfortable silence everywhere. The Japanese were known to counterattack on the first night and we were expecting that attack. Time went by and we continued to watch and, and to wait in the quiet darkness. It seemed that hours had gone by and no sign of the enemy. No indication of a counterattack, but suddenly at about I think about 9 or 10 o'clock, the Japanese let loose with a tremendous bombing attack. Bombs fell, fell all around us throughout our H Company positions. And, and at one point, we heard a tremendous explosion very, very close to our foxhole. And we knew that the command post had taken a direct hit. And we heard cries calling for corpsmen. Dave Moses and I crawled to the command post to find everyone dead or badly wounded and a couple of corpsmen were tending to those who were still alive. Captain Hall was terribly wounded, bleeding badly from the chest area and a corpsman was attempting to administer plasma to the captain and, and when the corpsman saw me, he he asked that I hold the captain in my arms as he administered the blood. 
the captain was in shock, but he recognized me and spoke to me very, very slowly and very softly, saying, Johnny, this is rough. And he closed his eyes and he died as I was holding him. I think often of my Marine Corps experience, I think often of the Battle of Iwo Jima, and I think of the many casualties that we suffered, but in all my thoughts of Iwo, I, I still hear the words, Johnny, this is rough. I'll never forget those words, and I'll never forget my good friend, Captain Ralph Hall. And finally, I'd I'd like to say in closing that I am most thankful for the good life that I've had and I'm still having at age 85. My friends, my family, and, and my God have all been good to me. I, I couldn't have asked for more. Well, Richard C. Johnston, we want to thank you for coming in and for sharing with us memories about your story and Iwo Jima and being with the Marines. Thank you so much. You are most welcome. It was my pleasure. As an addendum to the Richard C. Johnstone interview, Mr. Johnstone played down the fact that he had received the Bronze Star Medal. I thought it was important to actually read the citation as given to him for the President of the United States from the Secretary of the Navy, John L. Sullivan. And it reads, the President of the United States takes pleasure in presenting the Bronze Star Medal to Second Lieutenant Richard C. Johnstone, United States Marine Corps Reserve, for service as set forward in the following citation. For heroic achievement as a mortar section leader and later as an acting assault platoon leader of the 3rd Battalion, 27th Marines, 5th Marine Division, during action against enemy Japanese forces in Iwo Jima, Volcano Islands, from 19 February to 23 March, 1945, when the leader of an assault platoon was killed during an attack on 13 March, and the platoon became badly disorganized, 2nd Lieutenant Johnstone reorganized the men into an efficient fighting unit and immediately pushed forward in a successful attack upon a series of stubbornly defended and mutually supported cave positions. On 17 March, after reorganization of the battalion, he again volunteered to lead a new platoon in an attack against the last pocket of enemy resistance on the island. By his courageous fighting spirit and devotion to duty throughout, he contributed materially to the success of his battalion during the operation and upheld the highest traditions of the United States Naval Service. Second Lieutenant Johnstone is authorized to wear the Combat V. For the President, John L. Sullivan, Secretary of the Navy.